going to kind of preempt our series on the tabernacle and and uh, the new wineskins for something God has been giving me this last week or so. And every time I go into prayer, He's just right there. Don't you don't you like that? It's not that you got to strain and and all that. It's just God's right there saying, "Son, I got something I've got to share with you." And, and this is the time of year I really try to because I, I want to go into uh, the next year prepared. And it really, it kind of seemed to fit. When you look at the tabernacle, the menorah is in an enclosed area. It's in the holy place. There's a reason for that. God was trying to tell us that there were two different kinds of light. There's light that the pagans worship called the sun. In fact, in I believe it's Ezekiel that God took Ezekiel and showed him that there were men in the outer court bowing down to the east. And what you don't realize, unless you understand the layout of the tabernacle, to do that, you had to have your back on the tabernacle. They had turned their backs to the light that came from God, and they were bowing down to another light. And next year... In 2013, God said it's going to be the year of false light, and it's going to come in like a tidal wave. And you can kind of feel it brewing right now. Men want to be deceived. They really, their flesh wants to be deceived. And uh, we could kind of feel it creeping in this fall. And so God is saying, listen, I, I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready. How many know that? We're the elect of God. We're not supposed to be deceived. We're not supposed to follow after any other light except the light that comes from God. Let's go this morning to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And I love this one. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That just blows Zoe Aster right out of the water. That blows Confucius, Confuciusism right out of the water and that there's the yin and the yang and everything in the universe must be balanced and so God's half bad and half good. How many know that's not the God we serve? He's all good. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good in him is light and there is no darkness at all. You cannot find it in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not the truth. Now, a lot of believers like to forget that one. It's once I come in him, I can do what I want to do because it's all grace and darkness is good as long as you smear a bunch of grace over the top of it. Now, is that what the Apostle John said? I love 1 John. For the Apostle of love, he gives it right to you, boy, and he just slaps you upside the head over and over and over again in 1 John. If you say you have fellowship with light, the true light, and you walk in darkness, you're a liar. Let me tell you something. In the day that we're in, there's a lot of liars behind the pulpit. They were trained to be liars in seminary. They were trained to be liars in Bible college, teaching the doctrines of men. We need to understand that God is calling us to understand the difference between light and light. And darkness. And grace has not redeemed darkness. It did away with it. It's supposed to obliterate it out of your life. When you get saved, you're supposed to set darkness aside. Now, why is that so important? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceptive workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. An angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers can also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You look at what they do. Are they doing righteousness or are they giving excuse to do unrighteousness? Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Not by their words, not by their decree from the pulpit, but you look at what they do. And doing wrong and calling it grace is still doing wrong. 
Now, now, why is this so important? We, we need to understand there are, there are two lights in there, and since the, the conception of our nation, there have been two competing lights in America. You say, well, I, I, I don't know about that. Well, how many know the first when we came to America, there was something called the pilgrims? They escaped oppression in Europe because, as, as we find out in, in Dr. Marv Wilson's book, Our Father Abraham, they were feast keepers. That's one of the things they didn't teach you in school, was it? They kept the feast, they kept, they kept the Torah, they, they kept the Sabbath, and they were being persecuted by the Church of England for doing it, and so they came over here. The first Thanksgiving was also called the Feast of Tabernacles. That's one of the reasons why during the Feast of Tabernacles, well, that's when we have our turkey and dressing and everything, because that was the original Thanksgiving, because it's a time to celebrate and give thanks to God. But you go... A few years later on, and there were some rats that got a, on board some of the ships that were coming over. They were called Freemasons. Now, Freemasonry has its own source of light. This is a quote from Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma. Lucifer the light bearer. Strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer the son of the morning. It is he who bears the what? The light. And with his splendor intolerable, f- a blind, feeble, sensual, and selfish souls doubt it not. In other words, what he is saying, every the, the very initial Masonic ritual that you go through, they blindfold you, and you come saying, I'm seeking light. And from that day on, you, believer, if you were ever in Freemasonry, or your ancestors were in Freemasonry, they bowed a knee at a trapezoid shape altar, which is a satanic altar, and they said that all the light that they would receive in their minds would come from Lucifer. And what's scary is, I can go to most, many of the Baptist seminaries today and their presidents are 33rd degree Masons in many, many seminaries. Many, many pastors joined Freemasonry, and they don't know by the very act they did, they turned their back to the tabernacle of God, and they bow down to the east. They're the ones running Washington, D.C. They run our universities. They run many of our seminaries. They run many of our denominations. And everything about our society is based upon a false light anymore. If, they, if we separate ourselves from our Judeo-Christian heritage, all that we have left is another light. And that light is beginning to shine brighter and brighter in America and around the world. And next year, and what's interesting, everybody was so upset about the Mayan calendar. How many know that we're here today? The, the world did not come to an end, but really when you understand Mayan philosophy, it wasn't that the world was supposed to come to an end, it was the heralding of another age. And when you look at their writings, they were looking for Quetzalcoatl, I believe was how you pronounce it, hit the comeback, which was a serpent flying on a silver disc. Which interesting to me, Satan's a serpent, and you have that and UFOs all put together, and they come to bring another light. But we're seeing over and over again in our society all these attitudes of another light. How many have heard the term social justice and any time relevant to the times we're living in? They're doing all kinds of, everybody needs to be the same. Now the Bible says every man's supposed to give and every man's supposed to do according to his abilities, according to the abilities he gives from God. Whenever you built an altar for God or a structure for God using stone, Did you know that you're forbidden to even cut it? It has to be the way that God formed it. In fact, the prophets of old got really angry at Israel for making them out of bricks. Babylon made the Tower of Babel out of bricks. Why is that so important? I wish I'd, uh, some of this I thought of after I did my slides this morning. Go to the internet and, 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 and Google 
the EU and the Tower of Babel, and you'll see when they, when they were beginning forming the EU, one of their logos was the Tower of Babel. And the artist that did it was showing the people that were coming to build it, and they were all brick-shaped. Everybody's got to have the same. Everybody's got to be the same. We're, we're being molded into bricks. Pharaoh no longer has us making bricks. Pharaoh is trying to make us the bricks. And therefore, he's teaching us this thing of social justice. And we have the UN with Agenda 21. And we have all these different things going on. And what they're trying to do is take away everything and conform everybody to another light and make you into a brick. That's something that Satan can build with. It's the way of Babylon. When you look in the book of Revelation at Babylon, you, you see they control the silver and the gold. How many know that really, um, they, they're already controlling the oil. They've got to control the energy. They're controlling energy production. They're, what, what all, the, all the nations right now that the Arab Spring's kind of going through, all of them, did not have centralized banking. Libya did not have centralized banking. Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Does these names sound familiar? Probably Saudi Arabia did not have, does not have centralized banking. In other words, these are, the ba- these are the nations the Illuminati does not control their banking system. So they're all at war right now so they can fall apart so they can have an established banking system. They, gotta, they want to control everything. All the gems on the planet, if you have a diamond, ladies, if you have a diamond ring, it was because it, that sale was authorized by the De Beers. It is illegal on this planet to harvest, cut, or sell a diamond unless it goes through the De Beers. Do you know some of the elite control the opium? That was, that was their share. Therefore, opium is not destroyed in Afghanistan like we should have if we went over there. But we just simply try to protect them so they can harvest it. And then there's rumors of the CIA and others being involved in all this. They, they want to control. The, and gold. Do you know, you know, it's interesting to me. Everybody says, well, we need to buy gold to prepare for the days ahead. Anybody remember the Depression? Some of us aren't that old. But if you go back and you study history, the first thing the government did was give a presidential order that you had to give all your gold to the government. So you, you go, you, you're paying two or $3,000 an ounce, and you're buying all this gold that when they flip a trigger, you've got to turn it all in. While on the back side, everybody's getting top dollar for their spare gold, so everybody's cashing in their gold so that they can control all the gold. But it doesn't stop there. The book of Revelation tells us that they're, they, contro- they marketed the souls of men. They controlled them by making them bricks. They controlled them through mind control. They controlled them through the economy. They controlled them by poisoning their religion. And I mean, know right now there's a, there's a poisoning of the water hole in the body of Christ right now, and it's getting, it's getting thicker every day. We have got to understand there is a delusion coming. There is a deception that is coming that is growing stronger. And what God has begun showing me is that 2013 is going to be a pivotal year. Guys, I, I know staunch believers, what I, what I would have called growing up hardcore believers, that are now questioning things because they have become socially acceptable. Well, maybe God didn't really say. Maybe he did. And we've just fallen that far. Let's look at Matthew 24, 24. How many know we're getting ready to come to that pretty soon? It's approaching at us pretty quickly. And there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders inasmuch if it were possible that they, would, that they shall deceive the very elect. God began talking with Mary this last couple of weeks. You know, it, it, I, I, I love the, uh, the ministry Mary, God has put together between Mary and I because God will give me something. I'm already studying it out. And then one of the pieces that I need, she'll prophetically get, not even knowing that I'm studying and put stuff together. And she was praying the other day, and God said part of the problem with the body of Christ is they have unfiltered light. You see, if there's two sources of light and you're not filtering 
you can't you can't differentiate between the clean and the unclean, the holy and the profane, the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, there are things at light, and I'm just staring at the light. It could be an oncoming semi. We need to understand that in the end times, there's going to be false messiahs. There's going to be false prophets. They'll even do great signs and wonders. And if we're not careful, the very elect. How many know the elect is the cream of the crop? The elect is what I'm really about, the remnant. I'm not about the peripherals of the body of Christ. I'm about those that are sold out to Jesus and sold out to the word. And when when it comes to what the word says, what society does, they always choose the word. When it comes between the word and their fleshly desires, they crucify the flesh and they do the word. And it said in in the last days, it's going to become so great that it's even going to be able to affect them. That's part of what's going to begin mushrooming. And begin, Satan's getting ready to turn up the volume next year. Now what is what, how do we filter light? Number one, the word of God. You better know the word. And you better keep your nose in the book. I mean, years ago, And I had this confirmed with Dr. Carl Koch because when he was doing his doctorate at Fuller, he was actually researching Ed uh, Ed Casey or whatever his name was and uh, the New Age movement and everything. And he said, he goes, I had to set it aside and go back to the Word because after a while they started making sense. He said, at first they sounded stupid. But if you stay in it and stay in it and stay in it, all of a sudden it starts making sense. And I I would have to set that aside and go back to the Word and say, no, no, this makes sense. And see, that's kind of the way it is with the world. If you stay in the world, and I'll just hear the world, and the only news you get is off the TV tube that has been scripted for you. Shakespeare once said that all the world is a play and everyone a player. But what we don't realize is that Shakespeare really didn't exist as what we know. He, was, he couldn't even sign his own name. He was so illiterate. It was actually a council of those that were in the occult. Sir Francis Bacon was the head. They transformed a language and embedded their, their stuff into the very uh, English nature or what, what, what became Great Britain or what was Great Britain. Entered over 30,000 words to the English language through the writings of Shakespeare. Guy, if he can't write his name, he doesn't have the, prof- you know, it, it, took, it took a council to do that. And they let us in on what they were doing. All the world is a stage. You see, I believe a lot of the things that are used to transform society to include the, the tragedy that we had here last week was scripted, was planned. I think a lot of things, wars are planned. World War I, World War II was planned. It's all to change society. Things like that have been done before. It was done in what became Nazi Germany, that they used tragedy, and they used it to take away all their guns. One of the first things Hitler bragged about is, we now have 100% gun control. Therefore, when the government takes over, nobody can shoot back. It's interesting to me, nobody ever talks about the Netherlands with all this stuff. In the Netherlands, every male when he turns 18, is trained to become an expert marksman and is issued a handgun by the government. How many know crime is down to nothing over there? If every house that you break into, that that male has been trained and is an expert marksman with a handgun, and he can load it and fire it before he's even awake and hit what he's aiming at. You see, that, that's how you curb crime. Because, well, if everybody's a deterrent, crime is deterred. Okay? In David's time, everybody had a sword. (laughs) You know? Come on. The Word of God has got to be our mainstay, our focus. The second, the Holy Spirit and his anointing in your life. I read last week how that we have an anointing within us that teaches us all things. And let me tell you something. The closer I get to God in prayer, what raises up on the inside of me as I'm watching TV and I'm watching the news is, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. They're lying. They're scripting it. The Holy Spirit rises up. and it, you know, it gets to the place you just shout at the news. <laughs> 
Sometimes the only relief from the lie is the commercials, and they're not any good either. But here's one that, we, that Mary and I have learned, is that especially when you're watching anything or listening to anything, they can do things with frequencies, that, that with harmonics that can kind of break down your will to where you receive it more readily. You need to learn to plead the blood of Jesus over what you see and what you hear. The blood of Jesus and the word of God need to be two of the main filters for you. This, this is dealing with spiritual warfare. And once you start doing that and God begins filtering, you quickly begin to realize this, how stupid everything is. Really? What everybody's making to be so important, you look at it and say, that is the most moronic thing I have ever witnessed in my life. One of these days, it's going to be like the emperor with new clothes, prating around almost in, you know, in your BVDs thinking you're wearing something. Of course, they almost do that every summer now and think that they're something. They're slowly transforming everything to take us into another light on purpose. They're moving us toward a Luciferian state worldwide. Now, I mean, this isn't something to hoop and holler about. I'm giving you an intelligence briefing this morning that we need to know. That when I was in the military, I was used to intelligence briefings. I wasn't the guy giving them. I was the, I was the, I was the PFC and the spec forward behind giving all the slides, listening to the generals do it. But I knew it was important. And we need to understand. One thing that just recently came out this week, the Queen James Bible. Now, can we really blame them? You know, they, they went and they edited out, they retranslated anything that might seem homophobic in the Word of God so that no homophobic tend tendency individuals could misinterpret what the Bible was saying about this. Well, and we get mad at them doing that. Why should we when we've been ignoring 90% of what God said for years? We change the Sabbath to something else. We change his feast to something else. Well, I can eat what I want. I can do what I want because there's grace. So what they're saying is grace gave them the ability to rewrite the word. And this is the first step. One of the things that we need to understand in spiritual warfare when you're looking at a society, now not individual, but societal, a society sexuality is the canary in the coal mine. Always has been. That as a society moves away from God, sexual activity becomes perverted. And first they used pornography to corrupt heterosexual sexuality. I like what Lester Summerall said years ago, and I thought he said it very um, proper for a mixed audience. Tops are for tops, bottoms are for bottoms. Very simple. They begin to pervert that, then they begin to pervert all these other things. And, and they have transformed a generation that learned their sexuality by, through either bisexualism or homosexuality. And it's no longer the parents teaching them. It's no longer the church talking about it. They see it in all its full-blown devastation, many times free on the Internet. And that defines it. And see, that, that's why God says when these things start coming, it's the canary in the coal mine because it's not going to stop with homosexuality. Then there are already movements just as big beginning to take hold on pedophilia, reducing statutory rape down to six and eight. And they're saying, well, if, if that's the case, then really incest isn't really bad. It's just showing love. And, and of course, you have the tree huggers that just want to love everything, so you have bestiality. And there's already, there's already laws in the books beginning to take that being illegal off the books in America in many communities. You see, it's, it, the canary is choking to death in the coal mine, and we got preachers saying, everything's good. God's this blessing. There's this sunshine everywhere. There is, but it's not his light. Since this Queen James Bible has been released and published, it is outselling all traditional Bibles in America. Why? Because in the last days, people have itching ears. 
And it's not enough for them to have preachers in the pulpit that mistranslate and overlook and explain away. Now they're going the next step in rewriting the book. It's just another sign that a false light's coming. Now, in 2013, the level of deception and false life that will be released in America will be literally like a tidal wave or a tsunami. And people will start judging you on how you respond to it. If you don't respond to it, that out of one side of their mouth, they're saying, you're judging me, but they're not. They're silencing you by judging you and talking you down. But did you know that you can survive a tidal wave? You can survive a tsunami if you know what's coming and you prepare and you go to high ground. And how many know the high ground that we're talking about is the high ground of the kingdom of God? Take me to the mountain of God. God is my rock and my fortress. He is my strong tower. So what's a believer to do this next year? Now, guys, I know I've told you to do stuff before. And some of us over, you know, you kind of go through the year and it's like, well, yeah, but no, you know, we kind of fudge on it. Don't do it this next year. I'm tell- don't do it. Say why. I'm getting to that. Hold on just a minute. The believer's defense, the first thing you've got to work at is getting rid of your own self-deception. One of the things, whenever you're trained in counseling, there, there is a, uh, it's called reality therapy. And some have other done other works of, of how we lie to ourselves. Guys, it's like me sitting up here and saying, I am skinny, I can eat what I want. My metabolism burns it off. Right. But see, I, I say that to myself because I don't want to, you see, if, if, if I knew, if I really told myself that I was fat, I'd have to do something about it, which I am, by the way, because I looked in the mirror one day and I said, dude, you're getting old, you're getting fat. <laughs> if you're going to get old, at least be skinny, be thinner, okay? That way, when you tumble and fall, it's not like an entire brick building falling with you. But all the times that we, look how many times we deceive ourselves about stuff. And what, what is so bad about self-deception? We need to learn to tell ourselves the truth. Now, in doing so, we need to be stark and real about the way that we tell ourselves the truth, and we need to measure it with grace on how we tell others the truth. What we want to do is we want to flip it. We want to candy coat the truth for us and be stark and real with everybody else. No, you need to flip that. If you're stark and real with yourself, you're in a better position to, to put a little sugar on it when you give it to somebody else and help them swallow the truth. But why is this so important? If I have deceived myself in any area of my life, that becomes a stronghold to me. I am already deceived, and so all the enemy has to do to come in and to completely deceive me is to bend his deception to match mine. It reinforces mine. And if it reinforces mine, I'll go with it hook, line, and seeker because it reinforces the false reality that I have built for myself. Now you know how the Illuminati are transforming America. They have, we, they have based on our self-deception. I'm exceptional. Exceptionalism of America. The only time America was ever exceptional is when a people that walked with God in a covenant with God. The moment you remove that covenant, you are bland. You are nothing but another brick in the hand of Lucifer. And they take that and they begin to try to... And while I, when, you, when you really see what's going on, what, we even have people on the Supreme Court justices that are saying when, they, when, we're, when they're ruling on lie, let's not just depend on the Constitution. Let's look at European law. Let's look and let's, let's make sure that what we're ruling lines up with Babylon. No. <laughs> we fought a war to be free from over there 
And then we went over and fought two wars so that you could be free from what was over there. And now all of our leaders are following after that false light. Can I, can I show, show you how that you know that someone has a, a self-deception in their life? And this can be you or anybody else. Someone that's free, that's hungering after the light of God, when you present them with something, they'll consider it, they'll ponder it, they'll research it, they'll contemplate it, they'll, they, they will use critical thinking to go through it to establish what is true and what is not. They're like the Bereans. When they heard of Messiah, they searched through the scriptures to see if these things be so. And when they found out it was so, there was great joy. But... And let's see if this kind of lines up with anybody that you've met. You present them with truth, and the first thing they do is attack you. <coughs> Welcome to the stronghold of self-deception. So the first, if, God, if I begin sharing something with you, or God begins sharing something with you, and your first response is, you got a stronghold, Jack. You got a stronghold that you better pull down, and you have been given the power of God in your life to pull it down. The weapons are warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds, breaking every thought into subjection to Christ. So if I have self deception, that thing's going to have to be crucified, pulled down, and I'm going to have to accept what God says. And if you start dealing with people, that, re that respond to you like a ninja set off. You better start binding up the spirit of deception because he, that spirit is their best buddy because then they never have to deal with anything. That's why behind, everything's just rosy. It's not rosy. This is a time for the people of God to raise up and to pray and to do warfare and to set their face like flint toward the ways of God and refuse, I will not go to the right hand or to the left. I'm going to stay straight on what God said to do. I've got to. We've got to get into the word like never before. We, we have got to meter it out. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I've got to make sure that I, I it's time for me to get otherworldly. That when I'm reading this, I'm feeding my spirit man. Now, I wasn't going to get it, but I am going to get into this. You know, one of, the, one of the pieces of the furniture of the tabernacle is the curtain. Only through Christ, when Jesus died on the cross, he ran it from top to bottom. The holy place is your soul. The holy of holies is your spirit man. And your spirit man, when you're born again, is transformed into the holy of holies. And there's actually an ark of the covenant there, the throne of God. You're in covenant with God. And the work of Christ helps open that thing up so what's in your spirit can begin flooding into your soul. Therefore, it is rent. And the only way that you can have that flow and that rending is you've got to get in this book. As you study the word and you begin bringing your soul into captivity to the word, pressure builds on this side and pressure builds from the kingdom on this side and when they meet in the middle, they can tear that thing in half. Because what, where we got most, in, uh, most of trouble in our life, it never came from your spirit, it came from your soul. And what we need to do is allow heaven to flow out of our spirit into our soul. And to do that, I need the word of God. I've got to have a crucified life. There, there is more available to us than we've ever walked in. Our problem is we have never taken the time to be crucified with Christ enough to have that veil rent. Every once in a while, something will peek around the corner, and we think we have revival. We need to have that veil opened to let that flow. It's like nitro and glycerin. If you don't mix the nitro and glycerin together, all you get is soap. Or a laxative, depending upon how you're going to use it. But I need, I need the power of God, and to do that, I've got to have that. that. That's a whole different, another teaching. But time in the Word in 2013 is not a luxury. Self-deception says I can put it off to later. I don't need to do it. I'm special. Oh, I could have prayed, but, you know, I was too busy. Now, now, can, can I tell you this from just the guy's point of view? 
and all the women will probably say, that's right when I, when I say this, a guy will always find time to do what's important to him. Ouch. So when I can't find time to pray and I can't find time to get into the Word, what I'm telling the Father is it's not important. Mm. That's about enough truth to make you double over, isn't it? False light will be reverberating through all parts of our secular society. We must ensure that we are in the world, but we balance out the word in our lives that I'm of the world, but I've got, I've got to overdo it. I've got to overcome it. I've got to have my own tsunami, if you will. And it's going to take the word of God, prayer, submission to God, and humility. If I don't, I'll drink the Kool-Aid. It's just that simple. Next we're going to get we're going to get into the four Ds that Christians don't like. Dedication, determination, devotion and discipline. Those are going to be your safeguards next year. I have got to discipline my life to the Word of God. I've got to have spiritual discipline. I've got to make time to pray. I've got to make time to get into the Word. And I've got to make time to hear good preaching. And I'm not just talking about what I produce. I mean, there's a lot of other men of God out there that are teaching some very powerful things. I run across it all the time. There's one that everybody needs to get. We ran across on Sid Roth this week. I can't remember the man's name, but they have a book and DVD set on binding the strong man over America about how that thanks to the Masons, hmm? Benefield, Dr. Benefield, that thanks to us leaving the Feast of God and going into pagan holidays and all these things, that Baal has been established as the God over America, which is the prince of demons, and so all his little demons go on with him. And this guy has done the research. He has prayers where Christians can divorce Baal, and he also has a right of enforcement that we can see Kevin to plunder that strong man's house and to get what, back, what belongs to us. And I, you want to talk about timely. And see, if, if I get in sync with the kingdom, God's going to begin putting in your hands exactly what you need before you need it. The world may think it's serendipitous, but it's not serendipitous. It is kingdom appointments and kingdom timing that God will put in your hands what you need. And as you discipline yourself to get into it and to read it and to pray over it, you'll find out that after you get that into your spirit, you will be confronted with it within a week or two, and you'll be in a position to implement the kingdom in that situation. I don't know how many times in my life that sometimes even, even even just listening to a part of a sermon from some minister somewhere, he gave me a key that within two weeks I needed to learn how to use. Our God's that great. Our God is that good. And I got to learn to quit flowing in the world and flowing back in the kingdom. That's why I've got to be determined. Guys, listen to me. Now, I'll, I'll let Mary preach to the women. Whenever you have made up your mind to really do something, it always gets done. When you have really made up your mind and you become determined about something, I am determined that I'm going to buy this. An unsanctified man will not pay his bills so that he can buy what he has determined to buy. We'll just be a month late on rent this month because I have determined that I need this. You see, that's the flip side. How about using it for God? I have determined that I'm going to walk this way. I have determined that I am going to establish these things in my life. And therefore, no matter how much pressure comes from the outside, my determination bound up with discipline with the Holy Spirit, I can overcome any pressure that comes on me on the outside. The, the devil has used our lack of discipline and, our de and determining that we're going to do all the wrong things. He has used that against us our entire lives. Now I am determined to follow Christ. Christ. I am determined to do the things of the kingdom of God. When the whole world's turning to the left and the right, I will stay right on line with my Savior. 
There's something in the military, when you're in the middle of a firefight, they'll yell, hold the line. And that means no matter what the enemy shoots at you, the only reason that you drop from that line is you drop dead. You hold that line and you, you keep on firing your weapon until there's nothing left to fire at. And we have to have that determination. I'm holding the line for the kingdom of God. I'm holding the line. While everybody else goes into illusion, there has to be a stark example of reality. And I choose to be the truth of God. I choose to be walking in his light so that God can have someone to point to and say, I showed you the true light. If not through you, then through who? Discipline. Jesus said, I have called you to be my disciples. It's amazing to me that those that brag the most about being disciples of Christ have the least discipline in their lives I've ever seen of anybody. I think there's going to be a whole lot of disciples lining up and Jesus is going to say, why did you call me Lord, Lord, and didn't do a thing I said to you? Disciple means you discipline your lives by the teaching of another. Jesus was almighty God come in the flesh who taught us. He showed us how to live what he gave through Moses. That's what he has called us to disciple ourselves, to discipline ourselves to be like. Look at how Jesus kept the feast, how Jesus kept the Sabbath, how Jesus walked in the commandments of God in stark contrast to the traditions of men. And he's saying, I'm calling you to, dis- to discipline yourself to walk the exact same way. If you don't do that, you can still call yourself a Christian. But John said, you're walking in darkness and you're a liar. Whew. Why am I preaching this so hard? Listen to me. What you don't fight to control in 2013 will completely control you by 2014. If you don't overcome it, if you don't discipline yourself, and God's going to give you the tools this next year, he's going to give you the power, he's going to give you the knowledge, he's going to give you the wisdom to bring those things, those self-deceptions under control and to bring them captive to him. If you don't do it this next year, they will completely control you the following year. I mean, no, we're out of kindergarten right now. In the kingdom of God, we're out of kindergarten. You better be. We're about ready to go into graduate school. God's saying, hold on. One of our chief weapons. Well, give me a sword, brother, that I can use. Give me a shield that I can use. Okay, I'm going to give you something. The brazen altar and the cross. It's going to become a major part of our priesthood next year. God shows you it. You're to kill it. You're to crucify it. You're to burn it up on that altar. Don't let it get off. The more it squeals, tie it down harder. I have learned to get excited when I get a hold of something Satan has snuck in my life and I really get a hold of a good to start squealing. How many know nothing squeals unless it's scared? For the first time in your life, you have a demon scared. Don't let it off the hook. I want to look at a couple of scriptures here. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, now he said it to his disciples, his disciples, those who discipline themselves to live like he was living. So if you're not disciplining yourself to live like he was living, then this doesn't apply to you. If a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is, what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Lose his own soul. What was it that Babylon marketed? The souls of men. What is a gain of man if he learns to play the Babylonian game and he finds out that what they were marketing was him? Just food for thought. 
Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in glory of, his, of the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to grace. No, works. There's that works again. Do you know as a believer, how many know the world's going to get judged for their works? How many know that as a believer, I guarantee you, you're going to get judged for your works? Not for sin, for your works. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians, said, Every man upon the, no other foundation we lay except that which the Messiah and the, and, the, and, the, and the apostles and the prophets did, that all your works will be laid before him. Wood, hand, stubble, gold, silver, precious gems. The fire of God will come on that. It's talking about believers. And it's saying that some believers will have nothing left of their life. Nothing God, you saved me, didn't do another thing in my entire life, but he said, but by grace, you can come in. What we don't realize is, how can I put this? Some of us are going to have crowns when we get to heaven. Now, those crowns are not to strut around saying, I got four crowns, you got two. What are those crowns made of? Gold, silver, silver and precious gems. The works that you did because Christ was working in you become the material that creates your crown so that you have something to cast at his feet. Because the feasts teach us never appear before the Lord empty-handed. You always bring an offering. And when all is said and done, the only thing you get to bring him was your life. I like to have at least a nugget. <laughs> you know, I don't want to appear before the Lord empty handed. I, I want to say, listen, because I yielded to you, look at what you did in me. All this, all this, the gold and silver and precious gems was you living in me. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It was Christ living in me. Therefore, all this belongs to you. How much better than that than showing up going like this? I got nothing. I didn't crucify nothing. I didn't do nothing. I thought grace was greasy. The world's getting judged too. Now, I want to read this again out of the Amplified Bible because I think it brings it to light. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, forget himself and his own interests. Boy, if we could do that in most churches today, every church argument would be stopped immediately. It's people's agendas get in the way of God's and they split the church over it. We got to lose sight of our own interest and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conforming wholly to my example and living and if need be and dying also. And whosoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here shall lose it eternally. How many know that's a cold slap in the face? And I don't know so much of what he was talking about was losing your salvation as it was losing your soul. But the thing is, if you completely lose your soul to Babylon, are you still saved? It's the conundrum that we need to answer. Well, brother, I was taught once saved, always saved. Here's what Jesus said. If you're saved, they'll know it by your fruit. If you don't have any fruit, you aren't saved. Period. Well, are you a Calvinist or an Armenist? I'm a Hebraist. What does that mean? Calvin says, only if, you're, if, if you are the elect, you'll hold out to the end. Grace is irrevocable. Armenian says, if you hold out to the end, you're saved. The important part is kind of hold that to the end, don't you think? Because a rabbi will look at that entire argument, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, he'll say, what's the problem? 
Well, 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 what do you mean what's the problem? He said there's a mystery in between. He said if you can connect all the dots, linear, linear thinking, instead of block logic, you're not dealing with God. There has to be some mystery in between of the sovereignty of God. God is absolutely sovereign, but yet he can give free will to man. And you know where the sovereignty comes in? Man is accountable to a sovereign God. Nothing man can do could ever knock him off the throne. Just the same way if, if, now we're just, what, two weeks away from the first of the year. Let's say you decide you don't need to pay any taxes for 2012. And you exercise your free will to not do a, not to not to turn in your te- not to do a, a 1090 next year. How many know about May? The IRS will exert its sovereignty over your free will and say, "I hold you accountable for not filing those forms." Your act to your free will did not deceit the, the federal government nor the IRS. I can say there's no such thing as sin. I can do what I want, but it does not uh, it does not unthrone God. He is sovereign and I am answerable to his sovereignty whether I flowed with him or against him. You see the only the only thing that's answerable to is him and what I did with him. Did I yield to him or did I fight him my whole life? Did I yield to his light or did I follow another light that was easier on my flesh telling me that I could become him? That's Luciferianism, that I can become a god. It started in Babylon. It's being preached from pulpits. It's being preached from university. You, Nietzsche said it. We can, we can be, become the new man that is beyond good and evil. Ain't no such thing. Only a moron. They, uh, oh God. Everybody's always worried about who's going to be the man of the year on Time Magazine. I found out that before World War II, Mussolini was man of the year. I thought, <laughs> you guys have been calling it wrong ever since. And if you read it's like, the moment it came out of his lips, it became law. He didn't have to obey the law. He created the law with his spoken word. I'm thinking, no, you're, what you're doing is you are such a progressive and a liberal. Since you've rejected God, you have to worship a man. That's why when you go to the Democratic Convention, whoever's elected, they're all going, oh, oh. They want to worship a man. They're waiting for a man to become a god. And after they die, we we give them initials, JFK, FDR. And and they they say it almost swooning, FDR. The only time I swoon is when I say, J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. He's my God. Yahweh Elohim, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I follow his light. I follow his word. I follow his law. I follow his commandments. I follow his kingdom. I am of another kingdom. I am not an American first. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God first. And my, any other citizenship? Well, brother, you're a citizen of this world. No, I'm not. I'm just passing through. I'm like Abraham. I'm looking for that city whose builder and maker was God. We're going to see some of the greatest deception that we have ever seen next year. They're going to promise you everything possible. If If you just yield to what we want, the streets will be paved with gold. There will be butterflies and unicorns and glitter everywhere. Sometimes they say there'll be a chicken in every pot. But what they're wanting to do is to make you into a brick for Lucifer's wall, Lucifer's altar. I refuse to be conformed unto this world by I have chosen to lay my life as a sacrifice, which is my reasonable service unto God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. That's not doesn't mean to find out. It means to be a demonstration of the perfect will of God. That's what you get to do next year. That's what I get to do next year. Because I think we're going to be the last generation that really gets to do it. 
If you don't go uphill next year, everything is downhill. It's going to be a slippery slope into deception. And Satan will use our own self-deceptions to work his deal. Guys, we've got to understand. It's probably one of the hardest sermons I've preached in a while, but it's the truth. It is the truth. And we need to understand. I want you to go into 2013 armed to the teeth, knowing the word, knowing what right is, what wrong is, knowing what true light is, what fake light is, knowing what is clean and unclean, holy and profane. Let me tell you something. The canary is choking awful bad in the coal mine right now. It's time for us to wake up and realize where we are. Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I break the power of self-deception off every one of us. Father, the lies that we told ourselves over the years have done us no service. They have done a disservice to them, to us. And Father, we repent of those lies. We repent of the influence of self-deception. We choose to speak to ourselves and to each other truth, as the Apostle Paul had commanded. And Father, as we do, we will break deception completely out of our lives, and it will allow us to quickly discern what is of you and what is of not. And Father, we just thank you, and we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.